from the SAP Center at San Jose, home of the San Jose Sharks. Extracting the signal from the noise, it's the Cube, covering HGST Sports Data Silicon Valley. Brought to you by HGST. Now your hosts, John Furrier and Jeff Frick. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are here live in San Jose at the Shark Tank. This is theCUBE, SiliconANGLE's flagship program. We go out to the events, extract the signal from noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconANGLE. I'm joined by my co-host Jeff Frick, the general manager of theCUBE. Special presentation here at the Shark Tank. Our next guest is David Tang, SVP and general manager of HGST, Cloud Infrastructure Business Unit. Welcome to theCUBE, special presentation. Thanks, it's great to be here. And always great to be back in theCUBE and especially here uh, yeah. at SAP Center, yeah. home of the Shark. A live audience, everybody's excited. So I said on my Facebook broadcast, the Cube, HGST, and your customers, it's a hat trick of innovation. <laughs> and oh, it really is, thank you so it. much, appreciate it. The, um, the, the sports, we love sports, because sports now really emphasizes the future of IT and the cloud, managing your employees, managing your fans, customers, and also the, 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 the experience of that, all that together now is, is now the holy grail for all businesses. Right, absolutely. Sports is like, a, it's a microcosm of the whole big data movement and IoT movement, right? You've got customers or fans and their experience, their engagement can be improved all based on data. And from the perspective of the team, the players, um, they, they can make a better product, they can uh, ensure performance is at, at its maximum, uh, and, and even prevent uh, injuries to their, to their key players. So it's, it's a fantastic uh, opportunity and fantastic way to, to really emphasize the value of data. You know, data is a competitive advantage, and that's one thing that's now has hit mainstream, it was kind of in the early adopter, the Silicon Valley echo chamber, and all the elite and the vendors were out there doing it. Now with big data analytics and cloud, and having data available, not just stored, but real time, we mentioned earlier, real time communications, mobile devices, but now you have new fan experiences, Oculus Rift, virtual reality, those are data driven around. So, so will there be a slowdown in storage and cloud? <laughs> <laughs> Rhetorical, you don't have to answer. Obviously yes. Right, What's yeah. your take on that? I mean, it's, it's never ending. It, it is never ending. I mean, the, the amount of data that's being created is, is growing at an astronomical rate. And the amount of, uh, of data that's valuable enough to analyze in real time and store and, and reanalyze for historical purposes is also growing. So, you know, this whole notion of a, a data-centric world really equates to a, a storage-centric data center. So it's, it's fantastic, it's a great time to be in storage. And really the expectations on, on access to information, speed of that access, richness of that access, you know, we always talk about kind of before Google and after Google, which really changed the perception of what people expect to be able to get out of their little mobile phone. And, and now we've seen that obviously trickle into the enterprise, influence the enterprise. You know, they've got to make that data available to their customers, their employees, customers, partners, quickly. It's got to be there. And, and really expectations on the performance of the applications which are all driven by the data has changed dramatically over the last few years. Yeah, right, the, the demands on data are just um, skyrocketing. So it's not just having data available to you as, as in, uh, pieces of information, but it has to be actionable. It has to be uh, to help you make decisions. So driving not only to web-related response times, but driving to real-time analytics, real-time information, real-time decision-making, that's, that, that's the key. The, the other piece that keeps coming up over and over, we do a lot of big data shows, right, is it used to be you, you just couldn't afford to store everything. You just couldn't, the, 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 the exhaust, right, they talk about the data exhaust, you just let it, let it ride, maybe grab a sampling but now people don't want to do sampling anymore. They want to be able to get all the data. They want to be able to cut it, slice it, dice it, however they want. So now that's just driving more demand for more data, because I don't want to sample, I don't want to throw away. I don't know if I'm going to need this today, or tomorrow, or down the road. Yeah, a absolutely. So the notion of sampling has, has gone away. Um, companies, organizations want to store all the data, and not only that, they want to store it in, in raw form. Um, there, there used to be you tried to save um, space in storage systems by, by compressing the data, but now you don't know what kind of algorithms are going to come up in the future to, to, that can be used to analyze the data and extract more value from the data. So the last thing you want to do is compress something and, and lose future value. So uh, it's not just more data, it's the fact that that data needs to be stored in its raw state. David, take a step back and talk about any updates in the organization because now, obviously, the world has moved into this post-client-server world. 
We're seeing things, we saw the, you know, the big acquisitions are happening, um, Dell buying EMC, big consolidations, but there's so much new stuff happening, a new era is upon us, cloud, mobile, right. social, big data. What's new with you guys, and what that's some of the things that you guys are doing to take advantage of this next huge wave? Right. So a lot of analysts refer to this new wave as the third platform of computing, where um, client server, as you mentioned, is, is the second platform of computing. And the key characteristic of the third platform of computing is this massive scalability to take on the growth in data as well as uh, the, the ability to, to um, uh, stretch computing capabilities when you need to, this elasticity of, of computing capabilities. So this all relies on um, more of a software centric, mm -hmm. software defined um, uh, infrastructure. So you, you've heard the term software defined networking, software defined storage, software defined data centers. And the reason for that is that that's what enables you to scale uh, at massive le levels, petabyte scales, exabyte scales. Um, prior to that, everything was built in silos where they could only grow so, so far. So when we're talking about mm -hmm. the amount of data doubling every two years or less, um, we really need in environments and architectures that, that are going to manage that growth and do it in a very, very affordable um, way as well. Talk about the dynamic, because you mentioned silos, right? So, Data silos don't work well in this new data hoarding and kind of you know right. putting the data, putting it out in the far hinterlands of the company. It's got to be real time. So, so that's one thing. So talk about the openness of data. Why, why is it open? And then talk about this new analytics software market where data analytics and software, the interplay between that software development market and then this open data. What are some of those? And what are they? And what does that do for customers? Right. So, so the they're they're very interrelated. Those questions. So, so the openness is important because back in the in the world of client server and especially in mainframe, the the silos were made up of the application as well as the data. And the data w that was created was only accessed by that one application. Uh, now we're in a world where you have many, many applications wanting to access the same data. I mean, we, we see that every yeah. day with our own cell phones, yeah. our smartphones, that, that we have several applications that want to access contacts or, or calendars. The same thing goes with, with big data and IoT. You want that data to be accessible from, for multiple applications, therefore you need an openness, open APIs on, on how to access that data. Uh, and in terms of, of the analytic nature of, of that, that, uh, that structure is, you, you really need two different um, uh, general categories of, of analytics to, to be able to access the data. One, one is real time, the real time analysis of what's going on to be able to make decisions in real time. And the other one is that you want to store all the data that's, that's gathered from its point of, of inception and, and you want it, the ability to, to analyze that over longer periods of time or access it uh, over longer periods of time. For example, with, with video content in, in sports, being able to, to access any random, um, any random play and similar plays, um, that, that takes a, a very open and very scalable architecture. So, I wonder if you could follow up on that as, as, as content like video has become more pervasive and a more kind of a general purpose communication vehicle than it used to be. And what are you seeing from some of your clients in terms of you know, their demands for storage based on s simply shifting a greater focus of their communications right. effort, their documentation, their training, whether that be external or internal HR, you know, welcome to the company, to things like video in these rich formats. So video as a, as a content, of course, is gaining in popularity. It's very easy to consume, um, and um, it, it's becoming very, very easier, easier uh, to, to create. But it's more than just the content. It's, um, it's the abil ability to, to find the content uh, and understand the context in which that content was captured. So actually, in addition to just the video streams that are, that are being created, Content needs to be indexed as well. So the ability to um, to identify in the sporting realm, identify the players, identify the conditions of of, of play, the opponent, um, all the things that you would want to search on at a later time to to be able to call up uh, past clips or to try to predict what might happen next. That's all important as well. So it's not just a matter of the content or the data in itself. It's really about the data about the data that's becoming even more important, which is causing even even um, uh, stronger demands for, for uh, storage and computing. So we have some questions on the crowd chat from uh, Deepak. Any plans to leverage IOT to monitor concussions in real time? Um, and then um, in addition to using next-gen replay, um, monitoring impacts, this kind of, kind of equipment. So have you seen 
some of your customers doing things like that in the sports world and or do you have any general comments around IoT in general? Because it brings up a safety issue, which right. is a societal benefit. Right. IoT has that, so tie that together. Yeah, so I certainly think that that's, that's uh, um, a possibility. I mean, we see a lot of um, innovation in, in helmets um, that, that can determine what the, the force of an impact is. Um, don't necessarily see that uh, coming into professional sports yet, but I think with a lot of what we're seeing uh, in the NFL as well as in, in the hockey world, uh, that, that is probably gonna, it's just a matter of time before that becomes uh, commonplace. Uh, and I think, and it's not just um, the obvious impacts. Um, there are wearables that can determine uh, how much strain a, 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 an athlete is, is under. You know, are they overexerting themselves? Are they becoming more prone to injury? So I think even per, on a preventative basis, uh, IOT and wearables can, can help to, to play into. How about uh, the IOT trend in general? I mean, obviously this mm -hmm. being hyped up big time now. How much of that on your radar is all in? How big will it be in your mind? Do you see that? Is it a massive tsunami or is it just overhyped right now? Oh, I, I think it's, it's a massive tsunami, not, not just in terms of the, the, um, the wearable devices that, that I think are getting a lot of the play, but also other, other sensors that can detect, uh, detect other characteristics of, of people, of situations, environment. I mean, fixed cameras in arenas are, are an example, but you know, we're, we were talking to a company that, um, that's developing next generation um, image sensors, so they can actually do uh, very rich 3D imaging. They can tell the difference um, a, between a grimace on a, on a uh, professional athlete that's caused by pain, or a grimace that's caused by maybe disappointment uh, of the outcome of Missed a play. Missed the field so, goal, lost so, the game. So, so those are all important to, to yeah. feeding into that, but, but I, we just see a massive explosion for, for IoT uh, across all industries. So Dave, what if we can talk tech a little bit? We love Moore's Law, we, we love going to Intel, and Moore's Law is impacting all of the sensors, it's impacting the compute capacity, it's com impacting networking. What are some of the things that you can share that you're seeing just great technological innovation that's enabling the storage, it's got to hold all this stuff to keep ahead and to stay current with all these other innovation across the compute cycle? Right, so I think there are a couple dimensions to that. One is the, the underlying technologies that, uh, that enable um, storage devices to store more uh, and operate it at a higher performance. Uh, but I think there, there are other aspects of, of innovation as well, and um, that's really something that HEST is focusing on, is the ability to innovate in multiple dimensions. So we not only have the ability to, uh, to develop uh, hard disk drives, for example, that, that can store uh, more data because they're, they're helium filled uh, and uh, because we're, we're using advanced head and, and disk technologies. But what we're doing is we're looking at the entire system as a point of innovation. So taking devices and optimizing those devices for custom design hardware, designing software to take full advantage of that underlying hardware, really co-optimizing all of those areas within an architecture to drive the capabilities even further. So with our systems, uh, we're delivering more value than the sum of the parts uh, than, than what you'd get otherwise without that co-optimization. So, so we're really trying to take innovation to, to another level. It's something that we, we refer to as vertical innovation because we're covering so much of the vertical stack of the system now. And how much of that is driven by cloud? Because like you said, cloud is so big now. And, and really the promise of cloud is capacity on demand. That's compute capacity, store capacity, network capacity, that's just there. And the expected performance and behavior is Thanks to Amazon, I swipe my card, it's there for me now. Um, How has that really impacted your guys' kind of system approach to looking at storage as part of that whole thing as opposed to just kind of hanging off the side? Well, so the shift from traditional enterprise data center architectures, second platform architectures over to the, the cloud or third platform architectures is, is a key enabler to the innovation that, that we're bringing to market. Uh, because those environments just, just demand more scalability and elasticity and flexibility, as you mentioned. So, so we, we see that as a great opportunity uh, for, for our efforts in cloud infrastructure. We are at David Tang, the SVP General Manager of HGST, Cloud Infrastructure Business Unit. Thanks so much for coming on theCUBE here, Print, and thanks for putting on this special presentation. Um, give you the final word. Talk about the, the fun aspect of, so the shark, Zamboni there, the, it's you know, the petabiter, it's tricked out, it's got a little fin on it. Um, you guys are humanizing it, you're into sports, you have the CrossFit thing. 
Um, is that part of the strategy? You're humanizing it? What, talk a little bit quickly about, about that, all that exciting stuff. Well, so a lot of aspects there. So um, our partnership with, with CrossFit is fantastic. HEST was recognized as one of the, the fittest companies in, in the country. Um, and it's, it's not just the sense of, of getting exercise and being fit, it's the camaraderie that it creates in the workplace. So e even though you may think of CrossFit as, as a competitive sport, um, it, it actually builds camaraderie because you're really competing with yourself, with, with your last workout when it comes to CrossFit. So you have a, a full gym uh, full of people encouraging you to, to take your, your workout to the next level. So, so that's yeah. a great cultural aspect within the company and also allows uh, people, individuals from different functions to, to get to know each other and that, that results in, in better, more effective teams. I think in terms of, of just what we're trying to accomplish with, with data and, and, mm -hmm. um, and being able to enable organizations to extract more value from that data is we're trying to personalize um, a, a broad set of experiences. A lot of people think that, that uh, information technology goes to, to dilute that. We think that it actually can enhance that because think about it, if, if, um, if a particular workout um, um, uh, course benefits maybe 80% of the people, well, that's great. Well, what if I'm in that 20%? Well, if I could have big data helping to prescribe a very specific workout regimen for, for myself, I can benefit from that. That's a lot more personalized and humanized and prescriptive. So. Um, that, that's and that's, really a, new, and that's a big trend, it's not going away. That's the right. Fitbits, you got the iWatches, all kinds of sensors, human, humanization, because it's personal now. That's right. It's wearables, all that good stuff. David, thanks so much for theCUBE. We'll be back with more live coverage of the special CUBE presentation. We'll be right back after this short break.